Prague, and thank you uh, to Augustana College. And uh, it's really a, a privilege to be able to be here uh, with you all today. Um, as I suspect might be part of the tradition of giving talks at this uh, prestigious uh, lecture series that uh, the speaker gives some sense of a, uh, an account of their connection to uh, Swedish-American culture. And I am a, uh, was born and raised in Alexandria, Minnesota. Um, my, even though my last name is Kruger, Kruger, which is a German name, not Swedish, I do assure you that uh, 15 sixteenths of, my, of me is, uh, comes from Swedish background. My uh, great great grandfather, Johan Christian Kruger, moved to Sweden in the 1850s. Don't know why yet, I'd like to know more. Married a Swedish woman, and they immigrated to Minnesota in 1882. Um, the one thing that I do know about my great great grandfather is the fact that he was not a very good Lutheran. Okay. Uh, because if you look at the church records in the Vingoker parish in Sweden, you will find that he, uh, there was a long period of time where he was not attending church at all. He was not attending communion. And if you looked a little bit more closely, uh, I went to the Emigrant Museum in Vekshu. Is that the correct pronunciation? Um, I looked in the, the church records and I discovered that uh, he was listed as a Baptist. So essentially, he was a uh, kind of a religious rebel in uh, this Lutheran-dominated society of that time. And they made their way to uh, the United States. So a little bit of a point of pride. I've come from a, a tradition of uh, religious rebels to, to, to a certain extent. Uh, so I, I do now <coughs> reside in Philadelphia. I moved there about 22 years ago. There's a whole story behind that. Uh, but but uh, you will recognize Philadelphia. It's often been referred to as the birthplace of America, the place where the American Revolution uh, was fought, the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed, the Constitution was drafted and, and approved. Uh, but one, you probably know that about Philadelphia, but one thing you may not be aware of is that in the Philadelphia region, uh, in the 17th century, before the Quakers showed up, there was a group uh, from Sweden that showed up. This was uh, one of the, the only Swedish colony um, in the world, in the Delaware Valley of, uh, of what is now Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So Philadelphia today boasts the, uh, uh, an important Swedish-American institution, the American Historical Swedish Museum. I think I, I get the acronym <laughs> messed up, but we do have a Swedish museum in, in Philadelphia. So if you're ever in Philadelphia, please uh, look me up and we'll, uh, we'll go there together and I'll give you a tour. And uh, being that I am a Philadelphia tour guide, I can give you a tour guide, of, a tour of the other sites as well. So, so I mentioned that I live in the, you know, what is now known as the birthplace of America, Philadelphia, but there is a small town in rural Minnesota that contests this claim. This small town in Alexandria, Minnesota, claims that it is truly the birthplace of America. And it's emblazoned on the shield of a 28-foot-tall fiberglass Viking statue stationed near the center of town. You know, it's an odd claim to make, is it not? You think of the birthplace, you think of Plymouth, Massachusetts, Jamestown, Philadelphia. Uh, but what is the origin? of this audacious, bold claim. The year was 19, I'm sorry, the year was 1898. As the story goes, Olaf Omen, um, on the left, a Swedish immigrant living near the village of Kensington, Minnesota, was clearing trees to expand his farm field. Now with small trees, you could use a winch mechanism to grab the tree and pull it out by the roots. And clasped in the roots of one aspen tree was a long flat stone with strange symbols on its surface. Omen's 10-year-old son took off his hat, brushed away the dirt to get a closer look. Omen then called over his neighbor, and they later claimed that the stone had an ancient and weathered appearance. 
It didn't take long for the neighbors to recognize the strange markings as runic letters. Runes, the written language of the medieval Scandinavians. How interesting is this? This chiseled stone just so happens to be found in a region heavily populated by Norwegians and Swedish immigrants. So what does this strange message have to say? Here is a, uh, a translation. Eight Swedes and 22 Norwegians on an exploration journey from Vinland westward. We had our camp by two rocky islets, one day's journey north of this stone. We were out fishing one day, and when we came home, we found 10 men red with blood and dead. A-V-M, save us from evil. We have 10 men by the sea to look after our ships, 14 days journey from this island, in the year 1362. The implications of this find in Omen's field could have been profound. Proof that Norsemen had arrived in Minnesota centuries ago, 1362. That's 140 years prior to the explorations of Christopher Columbus. It seemed that this runic artifact could change the course of US history. And it turns out that this artifact known as the Kensington runestone was just the thing that these immigrants were looking for. In 1877, a, a Norwegian immigrant uh, writer named Rasmus Bjorn Andersen wrote a book, America Not Discovered by Columbus. <laughs> you tell the full thesis of what the book was by its title. And in this book, Anderson pointed to several pieces of evidence that laid out his claim. The first of which was the Newport Tower in Rhode Island. He argued that this building was built by Norse explorers sometime during the medieval period. And uh, this is uh, convincing proof that the Norsemen had colonized uh, this area. We do know now that the Newport Tower dates roughly to the 1630s or so on the basis of archeological evidence and I forget exactly when uh, the earliest archaeological um, investigations were done. It was, the latest one was the 1940s, I believe, that, re that really confirmed uh, that, that date. But because there was some confusion about the early ownership of the building, it was built so early in the colonial period that it stimulated the imaginations of a wide variety of New Englanders about what the true origin of this uh, uh, tower, this edifice actually was. Uh, Rasmus Bjorn Anderson also pointed to a, an artifact known as the Dighton Rock. Uh, it's essentially a boulder <coughs> with uh, some letters chiseled into it. Uh, we now know that most likely the inscription on the Dighton Rock in Massachusetts has its origins with uh, the native, probably the Wampanoag people who lived in the region at that time. But there was a great deal of interest in the possibility that other groups um, had visited Massachusetts prior to the arrival of the Puritans and the Pilgrims. So, but I need to back up a little bit because Anderson, when he was making these claims, he didn't just invent them entirely on his own. There were other thinkers that had come decades before that had made a similar types of claims. When uh, Carl Rafens, uh, uh, a, a Danish scholar in New England, translated the Norse sagas into English, uh, a, a number of New England residents, this was even prior to the arrival of immigrants, uh, Scandinavian immigrants to New England, but many of the New England uh, 
persons of English descent and, and, and definitely among the, uh, the New England elite took a great interest in this possibility that Norse people had visited New England prior to Columbus. And if you look at some of the New England history textbooks written in the middle of the 19th century, you will see claims such as the fact that uh, you know, a history book about Massachusetts would already can, can, uh, would start out with a sort of a prologue about Norse explorers who had been there prior uh, to the arrival of the, uh, of the English settlers. So a number of scholars have theorized, like, why would New England, why would the New England cultural elite be interested in Vikings and Norse ex explorations of, of the East Coast? Um, been a couple of, uh, I'll, I'll get into some of my theories later on, but one of the, the uh, conclusions by um, uh, an anthropologist, I think her name is Mancini, uh, her last name, she argued that the New England elite was a bit anxious about the new religious immigrant diversity that was coming into New England in the mid to uh, <coughs> middle of the 19th century. Most uh, significantly, Italians and Catholics and other immigrant groups that were perceived to be not white. So according to Mancini, the New England uh, elite embraced these Viking notions of Viking explorations as a way of bolstering the sense that true, that a certain type of pure white group or a northern European group or an Anglo-Saxon type of a group um, had the true claims, uh, the true claim to New England. So what Rasmus Bjorn Anderson uh, you know, wrote in this book, he's building on a conversation that had been happening for decades before. But Anderson, as an, as an immigrant, as an immigrant leader, used his writings as a way of helping his fellow Norwegian immigrants to embrace a certain level of, of Americanness, a certain sense of, of belonging. So Anderson, in this book, if you get a chance to read it, he crafted a narrative that Norwegians were, were instrumental in helping to found the nation. They were the first to come to try to Christianize the native people. They were the ones who made sacrifices to come here. The, the Norsemen, of course, were the ones who came from, uh, uh, they, they were even responsible for democracy in England as well, because uh, William the Conqueror had uh, uh, origins to the coast of Normandy, and that had been invaded by Vikings. And the Vikings, of course, were more democratic. So Anderson would use all this type of proving that these Norsemen uh, truly uh, gave a great gift to America. They gave America democracy. They gave us uh, all of these great, these great things. Now, Anderson was you know, can be described as a, uh, uh, a philopietistic writer, philopietistic writer, meaning his aim of his scholarship was really to praise and to glorify his fellow immigrants, to help them fit in, to help them become respected by the dominant uh, cultural hegemony in American society. So, but as a philopietist writer, he was very much criticized for his scholarly work. Uh, for example, the Norwegian uh, scholar Gustav Storm uh, was very adamant at that, this time that Vikings had never reached what is now the boundaries of the United States. And Storm's writings ended up angering many of the immigrants across uh, the United States at that time because Viking identity was so important to them. And just let me just give a historical aside. We, we do know now, as of 1962, that Vikings indeed did reach North America. We know that there is the settlement in Lonzo Meadows in northeastern Newfoundland that has ver been verified by archaeologists. At this time, there was not credible evidence that was uh, 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 recognized by 
credible historians and archaeologists, but we know, do know now, as of the 1960s, that Vikings did reach North America. Uh, it's still inconclusive how far they went beyond that point. There's an, a recent uh, uh, exploration of a, of a site on the southwestern part of Newfoundland that could have potentially been a site where uh, Norse explorers could have been uh, creating, uh, uh, forging bog ore into iron. Uh, but there's, the, the verdict is still out, I think, with the archaeology around that site. So we do know that they were near, but we don't have any proof yet that they came as far as, um, as these parts of the, the world. But getting back to the, the immigrants in the late 19th century, they viewed Vikings as a critical part of their identity. Um, there's a quote by one poet around this time period, uh, because we are reminded of the sagas of old and are proud of the land we forsook, can it be that the blood of the Vikings still flows in our veins like a still running brook? Uh, the great uh, Norwegian American historian Odd Lovell uh, talked about this cult of Leif Erikson, this obsession with uh, appealing to these great heroic figures from the Norse sagas that provided a certain sense of inspiration uh, to the immigrants as they settled on the, the frontier. So, as I said, the, the ground <coughs> prior to the stone being on earth was already uh, rich with all of these ideas and these imaginative notions of Vikings actually uh, being there. So, uh, the local community was ready to embrace it. But unfortunately, the early scholarly conclusions uh, were not look, did not look favorably upon this artifact. It was sh uh, quickly shipped in 1899. It was shipped off to the University of Minnesota, the University of Chicago, and two scholars, two linguists, looked at the inscription and said, this isn't quite right. This isn't the language here. Is not from the 14th century. This this doesn't really seem to fit. Um, so most of the scholarly conclusions said that this is not what it claims to be. So after these initial scholarly denunciations, it returned. The stone returned back to Olaf Oman's farm, and as legend has it, it stood as a stepping stone into his gr his granary, where Oman would straighten out nails um, for his farm. So the stone was almost lost in obscurity. It was almost completely forgotten if it weren't for this man, Yalmer Ruid Holand. Along came Holand. Holand said in his in many of his accounts that, that he first heard about the stone in 1907 while traveling around the upper Midwest collecting stories about the heroic Norwegian pioneers as they settled uh, the frontier. And he was collecting these stories to put, it, put into a book. And as he tells the story of his encounter with Omen on this farm, on his farm in the summer of 1907, Holland acquired the stone. Uh, they kind of went back and forth. Uh, you know, Omen you know, joked about all well, you should at least give me five dollars for it. Or, or, or Omen, Holen said, uh, I'll give you five dollars for it. And Omen said to him, no, you look just as poor as I am, so I'm just going to give it to you for free. Um, so Holen took the stone and uh, began a lifelong, decades-long crusade to take this uh, stone, uh, to take responsibility for it and to prove that this thing was the real deal. Even though Holand says in many accounts that he had no knowledge of the stone, there is reason to question uh, that to a large extent, because we have other documents which seem to indicate that he did indeed know the stone existed, and he made a direct path to Omen's farm to be able to get, uh, to, to, to be able to make use of it. So how did he make use of it? Why was this such a helpful thing for uh, Holand's writing project about Norwegian pioneers. Well, you get a sense of it when you read the opening chapter of his, uh, his history of the Norwegian American settlement, because the very opening section is an account of the Kensington runestone as, as the Vikings as the first uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to come as, as immigrants, so to speak. 
So it was a way of building a deeper history of, uh, of the Norwegian immigrant presence in this, in this land. So over the course of Holland's lifetime, he wrote dozens of books, dozens of articles. Um, I've read way more of them than I would want to have read because they're so <laughs> repetitive and they're so, have such circular, so many circular arguments in them, it just drives you almost bananas. And I'll give you a little bit of a taste of that later, but he was an extremely persistent uh, writer. He called himself an historian. But there's another dimension to his vocation, so to speak, that I think that we need to take into account. Not only was he, uh, you know, st he studied to be an historian, he, I think he did pursue a master's degree with uh, Rasmus Bjorn Anderson at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but one of the things that is often not noticed is that Yalmer Holland had dreams and visions of becoming a novelist. This was part of one of his goals. He wanted to be able to tell a, a, a good story. And we'll see how that worked out in a, in a little, little bit later. But first of all, let's look at some of the forms of evidence that he used to prove the stone to be the real deal. First of all, you may have see, seen these on the left. They're called mooring stones. They're essentially boulders with holes in them, holy boulders, all right? So, Holand argued that these <coughs> holy boulders were evidence of Viking travel because, duh, didn't you know, when Vikings traveled around the world, they would chisel out holes in boulders and put a mooring bolt in the stone and tether up their boats to the shore. That was his theory. So he found a number of these boulders throughout the Minnesota landscape. But here's the problem. In later years, we came to realize that many of these holes were used, were drilled out to be receptacles for dynamite. And they, these were exploded <laughs> to be used as foundation stone for a number of the farmsteads and houses that are found throughout the American Midwest. But Poland uh, did not really seem to take that into account. Another category of evidence that Poland put together was he collected a number of so-called Viking artifacts. And here's one sort of, of artifact. <coughs> uh, farmers from all around Minnesota would come to him, to Yalmer Holland. They would heard about his writings about the Vikings and the runestone. They would come to him with a battle axe or a, a sword like this. And, the, uh, and Holland would very quickly recognize them as authentic Nordic Viking artifacts. But this sword is very interesting. Uh, uh, contemporary scholars have actually looked at the sword and found out that uh, this is actually is not a Viking sword, but it is a a theater sword uh, based on a French battle sword, and uh, we know that this sword was actually produced in Philadelphia at some point <laughs> in the late 19th century. But yet, the locals desperately wanted to believe it was true. So. Holman goes on and on and, and piles up mountains of evidence about the runic language that he said fit with the 14th century. And then he relied on geologic evidence that, that uh, on the basis of a, of, a, of a Minnesota Historical Society a geologist named Newton Winchell and said that he had affirmatively said that this was at least, this inscription was at least 400 years old. But we later come to discover that there, was some, there were a number of flaws in Winchell's geological analysis. And scholars today uh, know that it's extremely difficult to date a stone inscription. It's nearly impossible. Uh, so all of these ev forms of evidence began to kind of fall apart. And no matter when Holland would, Holland would take the stone to scholars and experts and try to convince them that this was the real deal, but they kept saying no. No, this is not the real deal. There's, this, there's not enough evidence. But did Holland get frustrated and give up and just give it, bring it back to Omen's farm? Of course not. <laughs> because he began to find other effective means of advancing his agenda and his narrative. First of all, here's a map uh, loosely of where Holland imagined them traveling uh, from Norway uh, through Iceland, Greenland, of course, the Newport Tower uh, there, well, <laughs> down into New England. 
then Hudson Bay, up the Nelson River, then up the Red River, and then traversing across the landscape. And at various points of his argumentation, he argued that they were actually hauling a multi-ton Viking ship over the land and dragging it across. And just really didn't seem like a very efficient way to go. Of course, he modified the theory uh, as he went on. But the real key to his success, and I'll give you some data on his success a little bit later, is that he was able to embed his evidence or lack of evidence in a compelling narrative, a compelling story. He found an obscure document in the Danish archives that talked about King Magnus of Sweden and Norway uh, who had sent a commission, uh, who had commissioned a, an expedition in 1354 led by a man named Paul Knudsen. And this mission was to go to Western Greenland, to the Western settlement, and find out what happened to a group of missing Christian colonists who had seemed to just disappear. They had vanished. Um, so we, there, this letter does indeed exist. Uh, we have no evidence that uh, this commission was ever carried out. We don't know if this, this group ever returned and reported back. There is no evidence. But this document was enough for Holland to construct a whole different approach um, to his way of bolstering the Kensington Runestone. If the evidence did not work, you could put together a narrative, embed that stone, that artifact, in a compelling story that would persuade many. And it was so persuasive that the stone traveled to the Smithsonian Institution, and there was some ambiguity about one researcher suggesting that maybe it is old, um, and the locals, of course, embraced it as, we've been vindicated, but actually they issued a report a couple of years later saying it was not. <coughs> the stone went all the way to the New York World's Fair in 1965, and in 1963, a Minneapolis Star poll said that, found that 60% of Minnesotans believed that Vikings had reached Minnesota. So as far as a marketing project is concerned, as far as a, as, a, as a project of trying to persuade the public, a public relations program, Yalmer Holand was an amazing, astounding success in what he was able to achieve on the basis of specious evidence. So what is my approach? Uh, hundreds of books, I, dozens of books have been written about is it fake? Is it, is it true? Um, uh, I am not so concerned about the authenticity question. I be, I've become more so in the last couple of years, and I, I can explain why a little bit later. But primarily the, the reason why I wrote this book is I wanted to... Uh, the inscription on the stone, we, have, we don't know. And, and if you ask me, I'm a bit skeptical that it was Omen himself that did it. I can talk more about that later if, if you like. Um, but... We don't know what they <coughs> intended, but we can look at, through the historical archives, how people interpreted the stone, how they talked about the stone. So a homemaking, it functioned as a developing a homemaking myth. Secondly, it was part of constructing a, perhaps a sacred canopy, uh, a narrative that brought together diverse immigrant groups. Uh, Lutherans, uh, when they, uh, many immigrants, when they came here, uh, part of the, one of the quintessential characteristics of the American religious landscape is this notion of uh, one church breaking away from another. One group breaking away, forming another church, forming another community. This very much a fragmentation kind of, kind of a thing. So uh, religiously, the, uh, the landscape of the American uh, uh, religious landscape was somewhat fragmented. Uh, you think of like pioneers living on isolated farmsteads away from one another. So I think these types of stories of Vikings who had come before us provide these types of inspirational narratives that can bind us together and help us to find community no matter how fragmented we are together. Um, another important uh, dimension of uh, the appeal was with, the, with identity construction, and here's one of the more pernicious, darker sides of Holland's 
uh, defense of the Kensington runestone, one of the key pieces of evidence that Holand put forth to prove that Vikings came to the Midwest was the existence of blonde-haired and blue-eyed Mandan Indians. All right? uh, the Mandans were a, a native community living in the kind of where North and South Dakota are today, and there were a number of ethnographic accounts of blonde hair, some blue-eyed characteristics among the people, and just uh, just check out some of what the way that Holland talked about uh, them. Uh, here's how Holland described them. Holland said that the Mandan had superior intelligence. They practiced settled agriculture, and they were the most civilized and hospitable tribes in America in the Americas. And this superiority, says Holland, can only be attributed to them being partial descendants of the surviving Vikings of the Kensington Runestone expedition. Swedes and Norwegians, Holland goes on to explain, are of the purest racial stock. Even a few of them in a familial bloodline would be enough to make the Mandan so peaceful and kind, unlike the savages around them. Holland used the bodies of Mandan people to bolster a notion of Scandinavian exceptionalism. Of course, we know now that the Mandan likely uh, gained these characteristics from French fur traders, Spanish explorers that may have been in the region, but yet native people, the Mandan, provided a convenient foil against which to bolster the sense of Swedish and Norwegian superiority. It gets a little bit, it gets even worse. It also, uh, there was a, a way of using this story uh, to bolster a certain sense of a white claim to the landscape. Now, if you go back to the, uh, uh, to the inscription itself, there is no mention of native people. It just says 10 men were found uh, red with blood and dead. But in the imagination of late 19th century and, and early 20th century people, it was obvious that this would have been at the hands, not of the bubonic plague or some illness or something like that, but the hands of Native American violence. So if you're going to understand the Kensington Runestone you ha and, and its cultural appeal, you have to place it in the context of one of Minnesota's, or of definitely Minnesota's most traumatic historical event, the Dakota War of 1862. Um, Dakota people had been relegated to a very narrow strip of reservation land. They were, uh, had been swindled out of vast tracts of land through very uh, manipulative government policies. Summer of 1862, during the American Civil War, Dakota men raided a government warehouse. Some uh, uh, warriors went out to the hillside, ended up uh, killing uh, white settlers on a number of uh, uh, farms in the area. In the end, over a few weeks' time, 400 white settlers, perhaps more, were killed. And vast sections of the uh, newly settled landscape had been abandoned. Now, the backlash against Dakota people were, was relentless. Um, in one year's time, Dakota people, the population had gone from like 5,000 down to about 200 because they were, there was a mass expulsion uh, out of the state. And also in December 1862 in Mankato, Minnesota, you may have heard, the largest mass execution in U.S. history took place where 38 Dakota men were executed in the town square having been sentenced through a hasty military uh, tri tribunal. Now, when you read some of the, uh, the, the defenses of the Kensington Runestone, there's an interesting juxtaposition. There, there's, a, uh, there's a county history, it's called, it's a very mundane book, The History of Douglas and Grant Counties in Minnesota. Pretty boring book, right? It's actually not. Uh, what, what is so interesting in this book you know, they're written about counties all over Minnesota, but this book has an 80-page section dedicated to the defense of the Kensington Runestone. That's a part of the local history. It's really quite fascinating. And if you look at some of the language 
Uh, the, the book opens up with the story of the Kensington Runestone, the Vikings that had, had uh, come to Minnesota. But then also, it's, if you look closely at the language, there's a reference to the savage scralings. This was a Norse word for native people. Literally, it means people who screech in the, the Norse sagas. Um, in uh, the first chapter, it's uh, uh, Constant Larson was the author. He describes them as the savage scralings who killed the Vikings. And then the next chapter over, there's the savage Indians who killed the Norwegian and, and immigrant pioneers on the American countryside. So there's a link between the two. So contemporary uh, European Americans, not just Scandinavians, but broader Americans as well, spoke of the Kensington Runestone as a narrative that helped to justify the white conquest. If you could show that native people were as savage in 1362 as they were in 1862, then it helps to bolster the fact of, of this notion of they got what they deserved. They should have been kicked out of here. They're not just savage today, they've always been savage. This constructing this notion of the eternally savage uh, Indian threat in our, in our midst. Another, and this is some more images here, but I want to get uh, five more minutes here, I'll try, to get to the sense of uh, this of the Catholic appeal. I bet you probably haven't, you had to consider before that Catholics took a tremendous interest in this Scandinavian artifact, so to speak. In 1909, Yalmer Holland, part of his PR marketing campaign was to make a presentation to the Minnesota Historical Society. And attending this meeting was none other than Minnesota's most famous Catholic, the Irish Catholic, uh, <laughs> John Ireland. John Ireland attended that meeting. Now, why on earth would a, an archbishop attend a meeting about a runic artifact? It was three letters, A-V-M, interpreted by Ireland and other Catholics as Ave Virgo Maria. Catholics interpreted this stone as evidence that the first Christians to Minnesota were not Lutherans <laughs> who were running the state, who were in all the highest levels of, of office. No, it was Catholics. Minnesota was founded originally as a Catholic state. And let me show you the, the production. I'll come back to the other one in a minute. The, the, product, the, the way that Holland constructed this notion of a Catholic <coughs> landscape. Near Sauk Center, Minnesota, are a couple of boulders, holy boulders, as it were. And Holland got a, somebody sent him a letter, a priest from Sauk Center sent him a letter and said, uh, Mr. Holland, uh, Professor Holland, a lay person from my church came to me and said that there's a strange boulder in the background. He's wondering, could this be evidence that Vikings had visited um, our part of the state? So Holland never turned away an opportunity to, to find new evidence. Heads out to this site, and he sees two holes uh, that were a little, it was a little bit unusual because mostly these stones, these mooring stones were located near bodies of water, but this was far from the water. No problem. It wasn't a mooring stone. It was something even better. You see these two uh, holes over here? You can actually see them all there on this side. This is where the Christian Norsemen would have put two poles and constructed a tarp over the top. And you see the two little holes on the far side over there? They're kind of like sitting out like that. Not for anchoring boats, no, no, no. You would have put two pegs in those holes and a board over the top and this would have been a play, the place where the Vikings would have put the Holy Eucharist. This would have been the site of America's first Catholic action in North America. So the priests were listening intently as Holland is telling, is theorizing about all the possibilities. You can imagine the banter going back and forth and the priest nodding quickly like, Yes, Professor Holland. Yes, I can get behind this. Um, so this is just about one type of evidence that he, uh, that he put forth. The, this type of negotiation with a variety of groups 
who also had an investment in this type of a narrative. Just had to show you a picture of this as well. Uh, uh, there's a church in Minnesota, actually, with the, with the title Our Lady of the Runestone. Um, you can see her, you know, this, this sacred revelation of the stone emerging from the landscape, the Viking ship in the, in the background. So Catholics. Um, we can talk about, about that another time here, but uh, uh, the runestone also provided a foundation for this notion that Alexandria, Minnesota was an exceptional town in an exceptional nation. And even if elitist authors like Sinclair Lewis would say that small town folks were backwards and insignificant and, and parochial, this runestone could prove that, uh, that, that the real history of America took place in Minnesota. America, or America was really uh, began in this insignificant small town. So entering into those dialogues about uh, the, the, the ethics of small town, or the image of small town. Um, later as well, uh, it began to be part of this narrative of this notion that America was founded as a Christian, uh, Christian nation. The Vikings were Christian and they, they founded uh, Christianity here as well. So, in sum, and we have to, to wrap up, we're, you know, the, the Kensington Runestone, in, in a certain sense, is a monument. It's a monument to uh, Scandinavian uh, ingenuity and creativity and, and, and power and, and a symbol of ethnic pride. And, it, and certainly among those who, uh, who may have cr who created the stone, there's you know, the, you got to respect them because they end up fooling a lot of people. And you have to have a little bit of respect for Holin in the sense that he was able to persuade uh, many. So there's a notion of the runestone as a monument, but it's also a memorial. It's a way of using an ancient story of sacrifice to, uh, to think about the way that your uh, immigrant group had made sacrifices today. And then lastly, the various layers of myth, uh, the myths of origin. Instead of America being founded with Puritans and, and pilgrims in Massachusetts on the East Coast, it's a myth of origin that locates, that reorients the whole map of American history and says that the sacred birth of the nation is in, not in Massachusetts, but in Minnesota. So here, here's my last thought-provoking questions. I think the Kensington Runestone is exceedingly relevant in today's cultural milieu. And, and uh, you know, how do we explain this uh, enduring appeal and this contemporary resurgence of fringe history television shows like America Unearthed or Ancient Aliens, uh, this whole genre of, of shows that try to uh, promote these alternative theories um, well, why are they so popular? And I'll, I'll pose there are just two cultural strains that we need to look at more carefully. First of all, is it an attempt to a certain extent to, to make pre-Columbian American history white again? Why is there this emphasis on pre-Columbian American history only when non-Indians are involved? What, why can't we you know, be fascinated by the, the vast civilizations that resided on the Americas? Think of the massive burial grounds in Ohio and, and some in Illinois, the Cahokias, and not far from here, right? I mean, these, these amazing civilizations, why aren't Americans interested in those civilizations? Why do we only talk about uh, pre-Columbian history if white folks are somehow involved in it. Is it an anxiety about increasing diversity in America today? Is it a claim to a whiter past, a way to reinforce uh, notions and cultural assumptions that we feel more comfortable with? And secondly, is all uh, the Kensington Runestone story is a part of a long tradition of anti intellectualism, of questioning and challenging uh, the authority of scholars and, and academics. This erosion of authority that we see today where uh, you can, as long as you can tell a good story, you can convince the public 
whether or not the science is actually there as well. So the racial dynamics, the science dynamics, I think these are the, the ethical um, implications that Kensington Runestone has for us today. Thank you. Thank you.